Hi, Colonel Tex here with the first in a series of videos showing how to install Beyond Linux from scratch. This follows on from my series of videos on Linux from scratch which you can find if you click on my name you'll see the playlist for that series of videos. Um, there's quite a lot of work involved in building a, a usable system um, in BLFS. The objective is to ultimately have a working system with a GUI and some useful apps such as a web browser and a suite of office software. As a finishing touch I'll demonstrate the installation of a game which is not in the BLFS book but it demonstrates how you can download and install other pieces of software that are not in the book and just through a bit of reading of installation instructions and following some of the hints in those instructions. So initially the first thing that will need to be done is to create a virtual machine uh, for this demonstration. I could use the existing LFS one that I did for the previous videos but rather than touch that, in case I need to use that for any other reason, I'm just going to create a copy of that. I'm also going to increase the disk space. We created a 8 gigabyte disk for the uh, LFS demonstration, and we used approximately 6, six gigabytes. So the remaining 2 gigabytes or so is not enough, and probably need as a minimum I'd say a 32 gigabyte drive um, I'm going to be creating a 64 gig which should be plenty of space so uh, that, that's just something to bear in mind that we to, to follow all these instructions you'll need about 30 gig 32 gig minimum we'll then go through uh, how to get packages at the moment Linux from scratch, it's, it is such a minimal system there's no way of getting packages on there other than uh, through the network or via a CD. Now with the CD you could do that but or a USB stick for that matter but that entails having to go to another machine downloading the files, copying them onto the USB device or burning the disk moving that physically across to the Linux from scratch machine or virtual machine and then copying the files off it's quite onerous. We can do it by networking as I mentioned however with the default LFS the only usable uh, network program is an FTP client so what we'll first do is to use that FTP client to get some packages which are available via FTP to allow us to download other packages which are available through the HTTP protocol and then as, as a step on from that we'll install um, some software which allows us to access the HTTPS sites which of course there are more of. We, we Initially we get around that by telling the client to ignore the fact that they're using a um, a site with encryption but it's, it's not ideal we will configure that so we can use in, uh, encryption. Uh, we go on to install a text browser which it's optional really I don't think I use that at all in the demonstration but it's nice to see and nice to have if at any time during the life of the BLS BLFS, sorry. Uh, there's no GUI, you need to access the internet and browse the internet. You can do so from the command line prompt using a text browser. We then go on to configure the environment, further configuration from the LFS environment, um, which includes adding a normal user. Um, obviously, this is for not only for security purposes, but security in the way that 
if we do everything as a root user, there's a possibility that um, we may do something untoward with system files, delete them, overwrite them, whatever, alter, alter some files that we don't really want to alter as the root user. So the, the layout of BLFS, as I mentioned with LFS, LFS is a recipe. You can follow it from beginning to end. With BLFS, you pick what packages you want to install. So for example, if you're setting up a server, you wouldn't be interested in any of the GUI stuff, any of the X window stuff. You'd be more interested in the libraries and the server software itself. As I say, the ultimate target or goal for this is to have a working GUI with some apps such as a browser and office suite um, and along the way I'll be showing or installing other pieces of software such as desktop managers, window managers and a selection of desktop environments so you can see how they're compiled and as well as seeing them in action. Also be compiling um, a couple of browsers as well. Again, you can see what they're like and how they how they uh, compile. So, the first thing we need to do is to make a copy of the Linux from scratch virtual machine. Oh, there is one thing I need to mention actually before um, with the Linux from scratch demonstration, I omitted a system configuration setting for the console file, which means that all the kernel messages were being printed out to the console, uh, all the informational con uh, kernel messages. Uh, what I've done is I've created a video to show how to fix that and I'll quickly go through that here but um, if you need any more details such as the sections of the book, the LFS book that this refers to, um, please, please have a look at the video. It's uh, part of the playlist for the LFS uh, demonstration. So what I'll do is first of all I'll boot this uh, image up. In fact, what I'll also do is make this a bit bigger because it's quite small as it is. Uh, right, so it's a bit, bit more legible. Yeah, so this uh, kernel message has appeared seven seconds after we booted and it's appeared right after the login prompt. So it's kind of hidden that prompt and it's not obvious what uh, the computer's waiting for us to do, being the cursor's down here on a separate line. So what I should do is just press enter just to get that prompt back again and I'll log in as root. I then want to edit using vi the file at etc sysconfig console. Now just move down one line press I for insert, press enter for a new blank line and then type log level as one word in capitals an equal sign, a quote and a three and another double quote and then escape colon and X to save and exit. Now the console scripts are only read at boot up, there's no restart or shutdown script so to activate this, we'll just have to do a reboot. So I'll do that now. Right, I've seen this a couple of times. I'm feeling it's uh, VirtualBox that does this. Occasionally when I boot or reboot, I get these kernel messages and it just locks up. It's uh, some sort of bug in the kernel, it says. Um, 
And yeah, it does seem to be with uh, one of the modules or one of the uh, virtual box pieces of software. So all I do is just power this down and start it up again. It, happened, it doesn't happen every time, it's just every now and then, and I've, I've not fathomed out why, why that happens. Okay, so it's booted OK this time. And as you can see, the last kernel message is just before the point where the scripts start running, just so in it starts and the scripts start loading and there's no other kernel messages being displayed so that's that's achieved what we wanted to achieve so the next thing we need to do is to copy uh, this image to a BLFS image as I say just so that um, we've still got a copy of the LFS image without any changes that we're going to do with BLFS and then we'll also increase the disk size as well at the same time. So let's shut this machine down. So I'll have to log in and do shut down minus H now. Right, so that's finished. So to copy this, right click it and select clone. Then give it a name. So I'll just change this to BLFS 8.4 demo. And I'm going to put this, because this uh, LFS image is in a group, which is in a separate directory, I'm going to put this BLFS in the same place. So it's in LFS, LFS images. It's up to you where you want to put it, if you have, it, have yours in groups or not, or just leave it with the default, it, it doesn't matter. Don't check these two items. Um, I believe if you leave that unchecked, it will just keep the, uh, it will create the disk name with the name of the virtual machine and the hardware UUIDs um, we don't want to keep them because we're creating basically a new machine so technically the UUIDs would, would be different anyway they wouldn't be the same so it would be correct to keep them different and we want to ensure a full clone is done this is basically going to be a brand new separate machine it's going to be a standalone machine not have anything to do with the um, source that we're copying from that we're cloning from so we definitely don't want the link to clone. So just click clone and it will start copying the VirtualBox machine. And as you can see now, it's copying the actual uh, demo. Uh, sorry, the actual disk image. And that's done. So we've now got an exact copy of the LFS 8.4 demo, and we've called it BLFS 8.4 demo. Now we need to increase the disk size on this machine, and not only that, I'm going to go into settings and increase the machine in general, the performance of the machine. In LFS, I wanted to make sure that there are no hazards created by having multiple cores. Um, I had the minimum amount of memory and disk space just to show as a demonstration what, what the minimum requirements would be to, to build successfully. I will be building this with multiple cores um, purely from a speed point of view. I won't be running tests again because of the speed point of view. Um, now this does mean that there's a risk that things could go wrong, but the BLFS is tested well, BLFS manual is tested well. We'll be following the instructions carefully um, and hopefully we won't have any, uh, well, too many mishaps. 
And if we do discover some, then hopefully we can uh, get around them. So the first thing to do is to go to system. And I would say at a minimum, you'd want four gigabytes of memory and preferably eight. Some of the larger packages such as Firefox, Qt, could well um, require more than four gigabytes of memory with uh, multi-cores. I'm, I'm gonna go for co four cores. Um, so on average, that's a gigabyte each. So there is a chance that it could use a swap. Um, so bear that in mind, if, if you've not got much memory and you do have to stay with four gigabytes. If if the compile crashes, just check to see if you haven't run out of memory, and if you have, then you'll, you'll have to recompile it with fewer cores. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, we'll, we'll go through that when we come to it. So to change this, easy, just to click on that uh, little handle thing there, and then just use the right arrow to move it up, and it'll move in small increments and when it reaches 8192 that will be 8 gigabytes. We'll keep the hard disk as it is and we'll keep the optical disk as it is. We will be attaching the VirtualBox guest editions at some point um, which will allow full screen to be used and the mouse to be um, seamlessly attached to the virtual machine but while we're in the command prompt those things won't work so we have to make do with the shortcuts to uh, um, move around between this window and uh, the system window if that's necessary it shouldn't be but sometimes you might click on the window and accidentally capture the mouse and you have to release it with the uh, um, uh, key, key that uh, will release and gain control uh, back back to the system so don't touch anything else here just the memory Go to the processor tab and we'll stick this on for CPUs. Um, just check the rest, I think the rest of this just stays the same. Uh, yeah, you might have noticed I've changed the version of uh, VirtualBox I'm using. The reason is I was having a trouble with one of the packages when I was testing this and I thought it might be because I was using an out of date VirtualBox, um, which was version 5, this is version 6, but it didn't seem to have fixed it, and I thought, well, what the heck, I might as well just stick with this version. So that's why some of these settings might look a bit different to the ones in the um, LFS demo. Got the storage, and there we have our disk, which as you can see is 8 gigabytes. It's actually 7.5 gigabytes on disk because it's a dynamic disk. Um, so this is the one we need to expand. So if you, how do we do this right? We don't do it here yet, so I just remembered it's in the uh, uh, media manager we do that. So we don't need to do anything else here. Oh, with the audio, we'll change that to AC97 because it's actually a little bit simpler to set up um, in the HD audio, so we'll just change that to there and click OK. So that's the machine changes for that. We've now got to actually adjust the disk. Um, if we go into the Virtual Media Manager, there's the disk. As you see, it's created a disk with the same name as the um, virtual machine BLFS 8.4 demo and it's 8 gigabytes in size so we want to change the size of that to 64 gig so just highlight it and again just click on this little handle and click the right arrow up to 64 gig and you'll see it jumps in increments that gradually get bigger the closer we get to 64 gig and click apply and that's done so it's now 64 gigabyte drive on, on that uh, disk disk image. If you click close uh, now if we start this machine
and log in as root. If I do disk free, you'll see that the size is just under 7 gig. In case a gig or so has been taken up with the file structure, but that is our 8 gig drive, and we only have 2 gigabytes available. And also, if I do fdisk minus L to show the disk details, you'll see that it is actually a 64 gigabyte drive. Now you may be wondering, well, why is that? Why does it say it's 64 gig, but we've only got two gig available? The reason being is effectively what we've done is we've taken an eight gigabyte disk, and we've copied all that data onto a 64 gigabyte disk, but the structures of the data on the eight gigabyte disk still reflect the structures of an 8 gigabyte disk even though it's been copied to a 64 gigabyte disk so what we need to do is to alter the structure of the 64 gig disk so that the um, structures reflect the fact that it's on a bigger disk so to do that we, we can't do it at the moment because we've, we're actually booted off that disk. We need to boot from another disk, another image, attach this disk, make the changes, and then we can go back and reboot onto the 64 gig disk. Hopefully it will see all the disk size. So let's shut this down now. We could boot from the LFS demo and attach the disk from this dem this BLFS demo, but I don't really want to touch this. Like I say, I want to keep that if I need to copy that again or use it again as a pristine LFS installation. So what I'm going to do is create a temporary copy of this purely to boot from to enable us to modify the data structures for the disk that's associated with uh, the BLFS 8.4 demo. So let's clone this again as we did before. We can leave the name as clone or we can call it temporary just to show that it is temporary. I don't really care where this is going because I will be deleting it after I've finished with it. So let's just do next, full clone again and clone it and wait for that to copy. Okay, that's done. So now I need to attach the disk that's associated with this machine and attach it to this machine here. So if I go right click and go to settings, go to storage. Now you see this is the disk that's been created, which is a copy of the original LFS 8.4 demo. That's going to be our boot disk. So what we can do here is add a new controller, new SATA controller, and I want to add a new hard disk, and I want to choose existing hard disk, and it's the BLFS demo one, see it's 64 gigabytes, choose that one, and that should be it. So now we will boot from that, and we'll be able to do stuff on this without fear of corrupting anything, because it won't be the live booted disk and we'll also set that for speed as well and click uh, yeah that's it just click OK right so now if we boot this remember we've got visibility of the disk that's associated with this machine so we're booting with this one So this is a temporary LFS machine we're booting from. Login. So if I do fdisk minus L now, there should be two disks. 
there's just scroll up there's this one that's eight gigabytes on SDA so this is our boot disk and there's the new 64 gigabyte disk which is on SDB so the first thing we should do is to check for errors on this new disk uh, should we do that now or should we do that afterwards let's do that afterwards actually let's go into it um, so if we type in fdisk and the name of the disk dev stroke sdb and do a p for print so we get the um, structure here what we're going to do is kind of cheat we're going to delete this second partition with the data so that's the boot partition and then we're going to recreate it but the end sectors is going to be the end of the disk and that's how this gets increased and then when we write those changes we'll check the disk we'll get a couple of errors but it will fix everything and it'll, it'll all work it's not an ideal way to do it there are tools there to resize um, the a disk but um, it, it will it will work without any errors so if I now um, delete that partition so delete partition 2 and I do P to print it's not there anymore so now we can recreate the partition with N for new. It's a primary, so just accept the default. It's partition number two, accept the default. First sector, accept the default. And the last sector, accept the default. And then it warns us that it can see that there is a signature of an X4 partition there. Do you want to remove the signature? Yes, we do. We want to overwrite it with a new one. And it says it will be removed when we write the command. Now do P to print to view that you can see the number of sectors has gone up and the size is now 63 gigabytes and it actually warns us file system signature on partition 2 will be wiped so let's do a W and it's been written so if we do F disk minus L struct dev SDB to view it again you can see it's changed So now we can use a tool called Resize to FS and we do that on that partition so slash dev slash sdb2 and what that will do all we've done at the moment is we've increased the partition size so we've initially increased the disk to 64 gig We've just increased the partition size to 64 gig and now we've got to resize the data structures to 64 gig. So there's like three tiers of restructuring that we've had to do. So we're now resizing the structures for that partition. Right, okay, so there's an error there. What we've got to do is we've got to check the file system for errors. So we'll do E2FS ck slash dev slash sdb2 in fact we'll use the f command to force it minus f uh, option and there we go we've got a uh, warning saying the number of count counts for the blocks is wrong and that's because we've increased the partition it can see that the partition size is different for what it, it knows about the partition and that what that's what this is uh, asking us do you want this fixed so we do yes so we can just press enter again we keep getting a few of these messages just keep pressing enter for each one and very soon at some time Okay, there's quite a few of these. So what we can do is if we do Control C, 
and then do man e2fsck there's a command which we can tell e2fsck to say yes to everything it's going to ask us so let me just find that option and just scroll down Right, there it is there, assume an answer, it's minus y, assume an answer of yes to all questions. So we just add that command, we won't need to keep pressing enter. So add minus y. And it tells us the file system is modified. So we can rerun that command without the y, and it should come back clean now. And it has and we can now do the resize command so resize to fs slash dev slash stb uh, 2 and it tells us it's resizing it and it now says that it's uh, so many uh, 4k blocks long so let's just check fdisk shouldn't have changed But if we mount this partition, mount dev stb2 onto the mnt directory, and now we do df minus h, you can see that it's actually increased it in size. Although it's not 64 gig, again, the, the, the difference is the structures that have been written to disk to manage the disk itself. It's certainly not 6.8 gig, it's 10 times the size. And you can see the used size, 4.5 gig, is the same as what we've got on the new disk. But now, instead of 2 gig 3, we've got 55 gig 3, which is more than enough for what we're going to do. We can also just check, just have a quick look at that directory, and you can see there's all the information for the, the new disk, all intact, all there. So now let's unmount that because the acid test will be can we boot from this new disk that's been increased in size. So let's unmount that and shut down the temporary LFS. Okay. Now we will boot the BLFS demo, which has got the 64 gigabyte, the new 64 gigabyte drive in it. So let's start that up. Okay, so let's log in with the root. DF minus H, and there we go. We've got a 62 gigabyte drive and we've got 55 gigabyte available and the very fact that it booted up without any errors and we can use the system uh, just shows that everything's intact there's no no problems no errors or anything so that's done so we can now shut that down oops shut down nice H now And we can get rid of the temporary virtual box image and its disk. So we just right click that and do remove. We want to delete all files because we don't need that disk anymore. And it's done. So the next thing we need to do now is to put this BLFS demo up and make some changes just to reflect uh, the machine that we're using. And you can see the name of the machine is LFS84 Demo. I think that should be changed to BLFS84 just so if we boot either the original LFS machine up or the BLFS machine, this new one, we can actually see when we log into it that we're actually on the right machine. 
So at the moment, I don't know whether I've booted the original um, LFS machine with the 8 gig drive or if I've booted the new BLFS machine with the 64 gigabyte drive. And if I wanted to have both machines running, then they shouldn't have the same name on the network. So for that end, I should also change the IP address as well. So let's log in. Let's root. And we need to modify hostname in etc. If I can spell etc hostname. And I'll just do insert b escape colon and x so that's the host name changed and I'll also need to change hosts in the same directory so insert a b and a b there as well escape colon and x to save and exit Then I need to change the IP address, so that's in etc sysconfig and it's the ifconfig file, ifconfig.enp0s3. And I need to change that to, what shall I make it, let's make it 223. So sorry, what I did there was, let's do that in case you don't know VIA very well. If you press Shift A, you get insert mode and it moves the cursor to the end of the line. Press backspace and then type 3 and press escape, colon, X to save and exit. So now let me reboot so that all those changes are activated the new host name and the new IP address is used. So this now means that I can run the LFS demo and the BLFS demo concurrently and they won't interfere with each other and I'll know what machine I'm on just by looking at the prompt. Okay, so the prompt has changed to BLFS 84 demo. And if I log in and do IF config and press enter you can see the where it says ENP0 oops ENP0 S3 the IP address is now 223 and it's not 222 right so now we can start looking at the BLFS manual itself so what I'll need to do I'll do a similar thing as I did with the LFS, I'll have the browser on the left and the command line on the right. But the problem is we only have this command prompt at the moment with this new BLFS. So the browser that I'm going to use is the browser of the host system. But at the moment, um, we're going to have to copy and paste or type stuff in from the browser uh, into the command prompt so we're going to have to be careful how how we type things so let me reduce this down a bit uh, sorry not that one it's Let's put this back to the same size as it was. Sorry, these menus are off the screen. I've just done view and changed the scaling back to 100%. And I'll also take it off full screen mode. And I'll move that over there. And I'll also do scaled mode because what I can do now is stretch this. So hopefully that's readable. Um, a little bit tall, but a little bit narrow, but hopefully it's readable still. 
which we've got a small monitor or small uh, viewing it on a small screen. Um, now I shall get a browser window up and just move that across here. Right, okay. And then I'll go to the Linux from scratch site. So www dot Linux from scratch dot org. And this time I want to select the BLFS link from the main page. And I'm going to read it online. And the version we want is the current stable. They now run a tandem version which uses system D to, to boot. Uh, I've never built that, so I won't be building that now. I'll just be sticking with the uh, standard version. Now if we quickly look at the errata, there are some, but they're mainly to do with um, security issues. There's a couple, that one there, with one of the packages we'll be building, LXDE. Um, I didn't actually have any problems with it. Um, and I'd rather stick with the standard book rather than having to go into their development site to use them. But um, if we do have problems, I will uh, go into the development book to, to install that new version. Um, security problem with libsec comp. Can't remember if we use that or not. And there's a problem with LibreOffice which again we'll be installing. Um, so if you're building this with an intention to keep and use the BLFS system, you may want to consider looking at that updated version with the fix. But for the purposes of this demo, I'll just be sticking to the book unless I have any problems. And so the rest of these are just security issues, which um, again, because it's a demo, I'm not too particularly bothered about. But if you're you are building a system to keep and to use for day-to-day -day use. I thoroughly recommend that you uh, yeah, heed these uh, security vulnerabilities and the uh, ways around them. So if we go back and we go to the book now. So this is the contents. If we start uh, at the front, again, with the LFS book, you really would need to read these first few sections um, probably read all of that up to this uh, second part here um, probably probably all of this section three as well chapter three um, we'll actually be starting uh, actually starting here I think important information because in this section there's a bit about using multiple processors which is what we're going to be using so what I should do is we've got four cores which we can check by typing in cat proc um, CPU and tab of CPU info and if we just scroll up, you can see the last process number is three. So we have actually got four cores. So we we need to use this make flags. You, you can set this environment variable or you can type make with a J2 switch or J4 in our case. There's a little bit more typing, so it's easier to set this make flags environment up so to do that we can modify one of the um, bash uh, yeah the bash files so let's have a look at profile oh no bash rc just so it's set every time we log in right that doesn't exist at the moment think actually this gets overwritten maybe it's not a good idea to set that at the moment come to think of it um, but I'll have to remember to set it otherwise we'll be typing make minus j4 for every single package and it will get a bit tedious 
so, so this this is not important now but um, if you can read it it'll help give you a better understanding of what what is needed and how things work boot scripts right we do need the boot scripts because there are some packages which will need to be started at boot time so that's probably going to be our first package oh no we can't download that one at the moment because it's an HTTP um, protocol so we'll download that when we first need it so let's move on to the next bit which is about these LA files um, basically it's saying that they're not really needed in the um, BLFS environment and it creates a script to back up and remove these files so we can copy that in let's put it in um, we're in root uh, well let's put it in user bin or even user s bin as it's likely to be a a uh, super user command so let's copy and paste that right okay yeah this is the another problem we've got to overcome is the fact that we cannot copy and paste into this window there's no um, guest additions for the console that I'm aware of um, I've never managed to get it to work at all it seems to be only for the GUI so we are going to have to come back to this and uh, paste that in and I'll show you what we're doing with that or how we'll be doing that um, so what I should do you'll see me using making extensive use of tabs um, to keep track of things that need to be done that can't be done at the current time and I'm going to be doing that now so what I do is just highlight the next link and middle click to create a new tab with that new link and this reminds me that there's something here that I need to come back to at a later time so I'll just carry on with the manual on this tab here now Um, we can skip past all this again read this please in your own time it gives you lots of information and we can start getting into some of the uh, configuration but before we do that because it's going to be awkward um, not being able to copy and paste what I'm going to do is install first thing I'm going to install a program called wget which allows us to download not only from FTP but also from HTT protocol um, links and then I'm going to be installing SSH which will allow us to um, get a secure shell up from the host system and that's where we'll be able to copy and paste stuff into that session and we won't be talking directly to this this terminal here because you have to remember although this is a virtual machine and it's in a nice GUI window this is replicating the physical terminal if you sat down and had a physical keyboard and terminal in, in front of you and because it's not GUI um, or it's not a real GUI screen it's not emulating a GUI screen that's why we can't cut and paste into it so let's get another tab up so I right click or sorry middle click to the home tab to get back to the uh, contents do control F to find wget there it is there and you can see this is one of the packages where there's an HTTP link in fact it's an HTTPS link and an FTP link and we can fetch this program using the FTP link now there's probably best time as any to mention dependencies all pa well most of the packages have got dependencies some haven't fine that's it you just install the package other other packages like this one have dependencies and there's several types of dependencies there's three types there's mandatory dependencies which they call I can't remember what they call them now 
required required dependencies. So basically, required dependency means that you cannot compile this package unless the required dependencies are met. So they're mandatory. The recommended dependencies are the next level down, and the dependencies that aren't required, but without them, the functionality of the package may be severely restricted. And then there's optional dependencies. These are ones that you don't have to install and you'll be missing out on some functionality that's not particularly important. It will be only important if it's something you require. So for example, if you needed um, HTTP daemon because the test suite requires it, you'd need to install this. If you're not running a test suite, which is, as I say, what I'm not doing, then there's no need to install that. Usually when I'm or when I have built BLFS in the past, I'll install everything that I possibly can that I think I need. So I'd likely to install most of these packages here. For the purposes of this demonstration, I'll be installing all the required and all the recommended, but none of the optional, unless it, it's something I particularly think is necessary or would be useful. So required, because it's mandatory, and recommended because it, it does provide some other sort of um, functionality. Um, and as you can see, the recommended there's one recommended dependency for wget, and that's this make ca package. But it says it's only required at runtime, so we can safely compile this package um, without any loss of functionality. And we can install make ca at a later time. And when we run wget, if it needs this. Um, it will just use it. In fact, I think off the top of my head, as I remember, the make CA package is the package that allows access to HTTPS um, links. So until we install that, every time we try and download uh, a package that has a HTTPS file, it will fail because it says it can't get the certificate. So we have to add a switch to wget to tell it to ignore um, ignore the fact that it can't get the certificate but once this package is installed wget sees the certificates and it, it just works normally with the HTTPS so we'll, we'll see that happen all of a sudden we'll be typing in wget and we won't have to type the extra switch in another thing worth mentioning is it's quite easily with all these dependencies that some packages have to get bogged down in what they call dependency hell you'll find that package A needs package B and package B needs package C and package C needs package D. And then you'll go and compile something else and that needs package C and it doesn't need package D and so on. And it's quite easy to lose track of what you've installed and what dependencies you haven't installed. There's several ways around that. You could rely on the fact that each time you click on one of these links for the packages in, in the manual, the link color changes that shows you visited it doesn't prove that you've downloaded it or installed it though so it's a bit bit flaky that one um, another way you could uh, do this is by keeping for example a spreadsheet and just copy and paste the name down and you could into the spreadsheet and you could you know have a column saying it's been downloaded and column saying it's been compiled and installed and so on um, or you could just keep a handwritten list or you could do what I'm going to be doing as we go through this is I've printed out the contents of the manual uh, because that lists all, well, almost all the packages. If I go back to it, you can see each package has got its own link. Plus there's a few extra links. For example, this one describes LVM, logical volume management. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Bearing in mind though that some uh, packages, which are actually modules, Perl modules and Python modules, don't appear in this list. They're actually in their own section. So if I search for Python, for example, you see there's a link there called Python modules. If I go into that, there's further links within that. So if you do decide to go the way that I'm doing this and print out the list of packages, you, you need to go into the this page here and print this little bit out as well as the Perl modules as well. There's two sets of Perl modules actually. 
there's Perl modules and Perl module dependencies. So there's that list there for Perl modules and there's Perl module dependencies, which is a much longer list. We won't be installing all of these, but there are some that will, will need to be installed. So you will need to tick them off or write them down. As I say, it's up to you how you, how you want to do that. But for this demonstration, I'll, I'll be um, ticking off this list that I've printed out so the first one we've got which is wget so i'm just going to turn to that in my list just so i know it's ready to tick off when it's been done another thing um, which we'll be doing especially early on while we're getting things up and running is for example there's something called pam pluggable authentication modules is a security device to allow or to control how users access um, things with higher privilege. Initially, some packages will be installing without PAM because we want to install PAM uh, to start off with. So we'll just install them just to get things going, just to make life a little bit easier for us, to, to make compiling easy for us. And then we'll install PAM, for example, and once PAM's installed, we'll go back and reinstall some of the other packages that we uh, installed or compiled when PAM didn't exist, just so that those packages are aware that PAM is now installed on the system. So there'll be a few packages like that at the beginning where it seems a bit ridiculous that we're recompiling them, but it's because there are useful dependencies that aren't necessary for the program to run, but they are useful that it, it warrants going back and rebuilding those those packages. It's a little bit like the uh, chicken and egg situation, which I can't remember if we come across. There's some packages, yes, the, yeah, we will come across it, come to think of it. There's some packages that have dependencies on other packages. So, for example, package A has a dependency on package B, but package B has a dependency on package A. It's a cyclic dependency. And to get around that, what you do is you compile package A and tell it that package B doesn't exist, so it allows it to compile OK. Then you install, compile and install package B, and that, that works OK because it can see package A has already been installed. We then go back and install package A and tell it that B now exists because it does. We've just installed it. So that's one way of breaking this cyclic dependency so it's a bit similar to that although not the same it's a similar process to get around these problems so let's get on with uh, getting these first couple of packages on which as I say will allow us to copy and paste commands and the first thing we should do is get somewhere to put all these packages going to download as I said Previously, there's approximately 500 packages we're going to be downloading. It's a heck of a lot. Um, and this is going to get quite tedious, but uh, we'll just break it down and do a section at a time, and um, it, it won't be too bad. So, Right, so let's find out where we are. We're in user bins. So let's go back to our sources directory. Now, at the moment, we're root. We will be creating a user a little bit later on, we won't do it just yet, um, purely for the fact we can't copy and paste. Um, and there's still a lot of configuration to do, so it's safer to do that configuration, I think, once we've got a facility where we can copy and paste stuff, uh, just to reduce the possibility of errors. So we're in the sources directory. This is the sources for the LFS that we built in the previous video. What I normally do here is just create a new directory and I call it BLFS and I put it in capitals just so it stands out from the all the lowercase files in there. Um, especially important at the moment because as you can see there's no color hinting on, on the files and that's part of the configuration that we'll be doing very soon when, once the copy and paste is, uh, is up and running. So make, make that directory CD into BLFS Okay, so we've got an empty directory and we're in sources BLFS. So this is where we're going to be spending most of our time in this directory. And this is where we'll be fetching all the packages. So 
we've got to use FTP so if you've never used this before I'll go through the steps we need to type FTP space and then it's the first part the actual domain of the uh, server that we need to type in not the rest of it so this one's called FTP dot GNU dot org now one thing to bear in mind when we connect to the FTP server they generally don't give you much time for a quiet period and what I mean is if it's sitting there at the FTP prompt and you're not typing anything it's likely to log you out automatically and you'll lose the connection um, you may or may not get a, a message stating that but you might find that you'll type a command in and it's refused and it's because it's, you're not connected so you'd have to start all this over again so it's um, reasonably important to type the commands in uh, as quick as you can bearing in mind you don't want to type it too quickly and make spelling mistakes uh, I'm not sure the normal time is maybe 30 seconds perhaps a minute or so it's, it's not very long though if you're sitting staring at the screen or reading something else the time will fly by and uh, as I say the connection will drop out so FTP space FTP is the command that's the program we're running and we're saying to FTP we want to connect to this address so press enter and it asks us for a name so we're just going to use something called an anonymous access and when you use anonymous access sometimes it asks for your password and all all you have to do if you ask for a password generally is to put an email address in I don't believe the GNU servers ask for a password it just goes straight in so let's type that in anonymous and now it's logged us in straight away there's some information there which may be worth reading if you're um, in an area where as it says here cryptographic software is illegal uh, so that's something to bear in mind if you're in a place that that's not allowed to be downloaded so you can see we've got an FTP prompt there's some commands you can do which may be familiar like ls which shows the files that's in the current directory that we're in but we need to navigate down these directories so we need to go into GNU and then wget and then this is the file we need to fetch so we just need to type in cd space GNU and it says at the end there directory successfully changed and then cd space wget and again we've got another message saying it's been successfully changed we can do pwd to check where we are we're in GNU wget which is correct GNU wget and now we can fetch a file to do that we need to go into binary mode because at the moment we're in text mode to do that you can type in binary or bi for short and it tells us we've switched to binary mode and also type in pass for passive to go into passive mode as well and now in fact if we do an ls we can list the files in here you can see there's loads of different versions here and we're getting version 1.2.0.1 which is just off the screen if I go up there it is there 1.2.0.1 and we're getting the tar.gz version although there's other versions there as well so to get this we type get space the name of the file and this is where you've got to type carefully so it's wget hyphen one dot two zero dot one dot tar dot gz just take a few seconds to make sure that's typed in correctly and press enter and you can see it's transfers it and then it tells us that um, the file's been transferred and how long it took and how many megabytes per second it took so that's that we've received that we can just type quit now to disconnect it says goodbye and we're back to our bash prompt and if we type ls minus l there we have that file wget dash one dot two oh dot one dot tar dot gz now as before with the lfs instructions there's a an md5 sum for every package but in F lfs there was a, a script if you like to check all the files because it was a recipe you had to install every single package it's easy to know what 
what files there were. Therefore, you can just scan them all and check them all. There is no such thing with BLFS because it's a pick and choose uh, arrangement. So for every page, there is an MD5 checksum. And to check this, you just type MD5, sorry, MD5 sum and the name of the file. And press enter. And that long string of digits there should match that one there. I generally just check the first two or three and the last two or three. And as long as they're okay, yeah, it's pretty safe to say that the file is okay. So that looks like a good match. We can say that, that file is a genuine file and it's been downloaded successfully without any errors. I won't be checking all of them. <clears throat> there are some uh, parts later on where there are several files that we download and there, there are MD5 checksum files which cover those set of files so that's the only time I will be checking them but apart from this time and I've only done this now because it's been manually downloaded through an FTP link so the next thing we can do is start building this and again it's the same as before with the LFS instructions. We're in, in the directory where all the packages are. We extract the package with tar minus XVF and the name of the package. And then we change directory into that package, uh, into that directory that's been created by extracting the package. And at the moment, the prompt is very basic. It doesn't show, show us what directory we're in. So we just need to do a PWD just to double check we're in the right place. Part of the configuration is we'll be setting up a prompt that's a lot more useful than the one we've got at the moment. So I'm not, I'm not going to bother changing that um, at the moment. Uh, it's, it's something that's just purely temporary. But we're in the right place. We can see all the files there. So we can start building. As I say, there's no copy and paste, so we've got to type all these commands in by hand. So we just have to do it really carefully. So first off is the configure command dot forward slash configure you can actually tab there because it's in that directory minus minus prefix equals forward slash usr now these as before in the lfs have been split over several lines and not only that within each grey box if there's multiple lines they've used the ampersands to concatenate the commands um, basically if you've not seen this before it means that um, if this configure command runs, then make will run. If configure fails, then no subsequent commands after the ampersands will run. So, um, and also these backslashes mean that this line continues on the next line. So it's no different to typing prefix user space sysconf, sysconf der equals etc. all on one long line. It just makes it a bit more readable. So it's up to you whether you want to emulate that. I'm not going to, I'm just going to type in these switches uh, as they appear, but without the uh, line breaks. So the next one after prefix user is minus minus sysconf der equals forward slash etc space minus minus with SSL. Sorry, that's with minus SSL equals open SSL so that's that top command as it appears here but it's all on I've typed it in all of one line so I'll just double check that dot configure space minus prefix equals forward slash user minus minus sysconf der equals forward slash etc and minus minus with SSL equals open SSL before I press enter, there's another thing that's worth mentioning. Some of the instructions for the configuration command have additional switches, but they don't tell you about them until after the installation commands. So, for example, down here, there's a switch, enable Valgrind tests, which isn't actually in this configure command, so it's an optional command, but it tells you it's there and it tells you what it does. So sometimes I forget and it's bound to happen to you but it's worth checking if you can remember 
just to scroll down past all the installation instructions to the command explanations just to see if there's any other switches that you might want to add or indeed take away to alter how uh, the configure runs and this is part of the beauty of BLFS and, and Linux in general actually it's down to you to make the choices you decide what you want to do and if something doesn't work it's not right for what you want or it's incompatible then that's when you look at other options to either include functionality or exclude functionality and in this case I'm not going to be running tests I'm not going to be installing Valgrind so I don't need that switch so I can ignore it but the other switches are explained what they're for and you know why they're being used so for example this OpenSSL with SSL it was OpenSSL that package was actually installed in Linux from scratch in the first part we haven't installed GNU TLS. We may do later for some other packages as possible, but at the moment it's not installed. So we'll just use this. It seems the most sensible option. It's there, may as well use it. So saying that, let's go back to the configure command and let's press enter. Okay, it's done and it's printed up some status of what is found. So, for example, PCRE, that's something we'll, we'll be installing later. And I think PSL as well, but they're not found because they don't exist. It's not a problem. And there's that Valgrind testing not, Valgrind testing not available and so on. So that looks successful. We can run make. And if you remember, uh, make, we're going to do parallel builds for speed. So I'm going to put minus J4 because I've got four cores. You can try five as some people believe number of cores plus one. Sometimes you can get away with doubling the number of cores and it's still faster than four. It's, it, I think it's all down to the machine, the software that you're compiling. It's, it's not a, an exact science, but I'm going to be sticking to the number of cores. That's what the, uh, the um, BLFS people recommend. So just sticking to minus J4 and press enter. Okay, that's built nice and quick. It was quicker than the actual configure command. So it says as the root user, we're already the root user. We shouldn't be, but we will be adding a normal user and all our subsequent builds will be built as the normal user and we will be swapping into the root user to do installations. But as I say, we're already the root, so we can just type make install. And that's that, W gets installed. So if I type W get by itself, there you go, it's run. So that's our first BLFS package done. There's nothing to come back here for to rebuild it um, other than possibly if we wanted to rebuild it after we've built these two packages or PSL as we saw, it, it knew that it hadn't found them. That was mentioned in the configuration, but there's no real point at the moment. So that's wget. Let's go back to home and install SSH, which is under the security chapter, chapter four. And it's down here. I'm actually going to bring this up in a new tag because I feel I'll be coming back to this uh, contents quite often. So open SSH. And as you can see, open SSH is only F HTTP links. There's no FTP, so this is where we would have got stuck if it wasn't for FTP access and if it wasn't for the fact that wget is available via FTP, we would ha have to have found another way of getting at least some bare minimum packages installed. For example, it would maybe wget or the text browser just to enable us to access HTTP, HTTP links. So uh, we've finished with wget, we're in wget directory, we can do cd dot dot to go back up one level into the BLFS and we now need to delete that wget directory so rm minus rf wget 
so we should just be left with that wget tar file which is there so we need to do wget now to fetch this and this time we type the whole of that link in so again it's prone to errors but it needs to be done so http colon forward slash forward slash ftp dot open bsd dot org forward slash pub pub forward slash capital o p e n capital b capital s capital d forward slash capital o p e n capital s capital s capital h forward slash portable forward slash open ssh hyphen 7.9p1.tar.gz now obviously if that's wrong it's going to fail with an error and if it's right it'll download it so let's press enter and find out and it's downloaded it and you can see at the bottom there it says it's saved and how many bytes and so on again if you want to do the md5 sum it's just md5 sum and the name of the file which is open ssh dash 7.9 p1.tar.gz um, and just cross-referencing the checksum c6a it begins with so does our one ends in e8f e8f so that looks good so then there's a required patch again all the patches I've been downloading I don't think there's any that don't 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 download and install generally re recommended to this one's a required one but where it's optional there's probably a very good reason why the, the, the patch is available so let's do wget again this time we're doing http colon forward slash forward slash www dot linux from scratch dot org forward slash patches forward slash blfs forward slash 8.4 forward slash open ssh dash 7 dot 9 p1 dash security underscore is next you can't see it because of the uh, line showing that it's a link but it's an underscore there fix dash 1 dot patch press enter nice small file so it's really quick 994 bytes and it's minus L to see it and it's there again there's optional dependencies and you see Linux PAM is one of them that's a package we will be installing so we'll be coming back to um, install this and I've just remembered that I haven't ticked wget off my list so I should do that now to say that it's installed and this package I'll be ticking with a little R next to it to say that it needs to be reinstalled once uh, PAM has been installed so that uh, OpenSSH can be configured for PAM use. So we need to type all this, these commands in now. So it's creating a user and a group specifically for uh, SSH, the SSH daemon, the server. So we type install space minus V space minus M700 space minus D forward slash var. We can tab here because it's part of the directory structure helps prevent typing errors. SSHD. So that's creating a directory with those permissions at that location. And it says it's done it. Now we can recall that and just remove the installed part of it because we need the directory as you can see there. We do chone space minus v space root sys root colon sys so it's changing the ownership of that directory. And you can see it's changed it 
from root routes to root and anybody in the sys group. Now we had a group called SSHD with group number 50. Group add space minus G space 50 space SSHD. And now we add a user. User add space minus C space single quote SSHD space capital P R I V capital S E P single quote. Again, I'll just be typing this on one line. So space minus D space four slash far. Again, it's a location we can tab this and that sshd lib uh, sorry sshd directory in the lib directory is there because we just created it let's remove the training forward slash it's just so it is, appears as it is in the book space minus g sshd so it's using the sshd group and now minus s space bin space false so that's the shell that's being used if I remember correctly space minus u so it's user number 50 and the username is sshd and press enter so we've just created a user called sshd with group sshd now really should have extracted the open ssh package but those commands could have been done anyway so it doesn't really matter but technically we should have done so I should do that now and change into it so there we are in sources blfs open ssh and first command we can do now for the installation is the patch command so patch space minus capital N P1 space minus I space dot dot forward slash open and we can tab this because the file name exists put dash in and tab again and there's the patch file press enter okay so it's patched one of the C files so now we can run the configure command so configure space minus minus prefix equals four slash USR space minus minus sys conf der equals four slash etc four slash ssh space minus minus with hyphen md5 hyphen passwords space minus minus with hyphen priv sep path oops path equals four slash far lib sshd so let's just double check that configure minus minus prefix equals four slash user minus minus sysconf equals etc SSH minus minus with MD5 passwords minus minus with priv sep path equals var lib sshd and before we go any further let's have a look at the command explanation see if there's anything else we might want to add so there's the sysconf the MD5 passwords with PAM so we haven't got PAM so we're not going to be adding that but when we come to rebuild this that's an example of one of the commands we will be adding that's not on the uh, instructions um, so this is for X authentication which we haven't got at the moment Kerberos we haven't got and lib, lib edit this option enables line editing and history features for SFTP so I think that probably needs a, a library anyway yeah it does so it won't be installing that so it will just use the configure command as it is for the moment and press enter
Right, so now we can, that looks like it's successful, we can run make. So make minus J4 and press enter. Right, that's complete. Not running any tests. So just do make install. It's installed and then we have to type all these other commands in. So install space minus V space minus M 755 space contrib. So this is a directory in the current directory so we can tab here ssh dash copy id and we're copying that file to forward slash usr forward slash bin that's okay install minus v space minus m 644 space again contrib directory ssh from copy ID dot one and that's been copied into forward slash USR forward slash share forward slash man forward oh again this this could be tabbed actually man one because it's a destination directory that should exist press enter that's okay install so down here now install minus v minus m 755 minus d space for slash user share doc open ssh right so that's not there it's come up with the open ssl so we need to type this in ssh dash 7.9 p1 and press enter and lastly install minus v minus m644 space install in capitals which is there we can tab that license is there overview is there and readme star is there space and we're putting that into user share doc open ssh and press enter and that's that one completed so configuring open ssh this it says there's no required changes to any of the files however you may want to review it and one they suggest to do is this one here which prevents root from um, connecting via uh, SSH remotely so it's completely against what we need to do um, because at the moment we haven't got a user we've only got a root user not a normal user and we will need to uh, SSH into the BLFS demo virtual machine because this is how we're getting around the problem that we can't cut and paste. So for the moment we'll copy that command in. Sorry we can't copy. <laughs> I'll just remember it again. We'll, we'll uh, copy that command in manually but instead of permit root login no we'll change it to yes and after we've got the normal user added to the BLFS demo system we'll, we can change that to yes and restart the SSH server so for now we'll type it in permit root login space yes quotes forward slash uh, sorry forward chevron forward chevron space 
forward slash etc forward slash ssh forward slash sshd underscore config that should be there which it is in fact thinking about it, it might have been easier just to edit the existing file but if we go in there anyway we can see so that file there we can see what change has been made and this will be right at the bottom because it was appended so that's that bit there as I say when we've created a normal user we won't need to telnet, uh, sorry not telnet, we won't need to SSH into the BLFS system as a root anymore we'll just SSH in as a normal user and if we need to become the root we'll just sudo or su so this is purely temporary and it will be much more secure when we when we change it to no but this, as it's only temporary just for the time being we'll leave it as yes so just escape colon and q to quit that without any changes the next few commands are how to configure so you can log in without using a part, password um, it generates a key and uh, it's it's something that you can do if you understand that uh, I won't be doing that because it's a little bit more involved just stick to using the login with the password but it's definitely worth looking at um, very handy just to be able to connect without having to type, type password in um, so the next thing we need to do now is to go back to this um, boot scripts, this BLFS boot scripts package which we uh, where were we? I'm sure we yeah passed that somewhere so what I'll do is I'll open this up in a new tab with a center uh, click oh, it's moved just so that we can get the URL for this thing so back on the prompt if we do pwd we're in open ssh I think we're done with that now let me just check yeah we're at the bottom so we can get rid of this directory now so go up one and then rm minus rf open ssh and now we want to do wget and type in this url here http in fact we might be able to recall previous one because part of that url is similar to the one we need to type in now So get rid of all that. So this bit's different and you in Linux from scratch.org forward slash capital B capital L capital F capital S forward slash B L F S hyphen boot scripts forward slash B L F S hyphen boot scripts hyphen 2018 0105 dot tar dot xz okay so that's there so now we need to extract that and that's done so we can get rid of that tab now we've downloaded and extracted it and this is the command we need to type inside this new directory that's been created if, oops. if I do ls minus l on that you can see there's the file we just downloaded and that's the directory that's been expanded so if we go into that and now we can type in this make install sshd so make install hyphen sshd so what that's done is it's installed several boot scripts for each run level and we can now start that by typing forward slash etc init dot d forward slash sshd and tab it to show it's there and start okay that server started now um, 
So don't delete the BLFS boot scripts directory because we will be needing it again. There's various other servers and daemons that need to be um, started at boot up. So it's worth leaving that there for the duration um, of the BLF installation. As there will be others and so we'll be installing. So just go back up and leave it there. So as you can see, we've started the SSH server. So in theory, we should be able to um, connect from the host machine into the uh, BLFS um, host uh, BLFS image. So let me go and open a console. Right. Okay, so I'm going to drag this console over here. And just check the size of that. Oh. Oh yeah, it's 80 columns. So I can just stretch this over a little bit, make that a bit wider. So this prompt is the local prompt. So this is my host machine. Um, and what I'm going to do next is just do, um, if I click on it first, echo dollar PS or PS one. What I'm going to do is just get the, uh, code for the, uh, prompt. So these escape codes and characters are what make this prompt a nice colourful one. So I'm, what I'm going to do is copy that and use that in the prompt that's on the BLFS uh, virtual machine. Just uh, A, so I can see what user I am, and B, I can see what path I'm on. Um, just make things a bit easier to pick out. So the next thing we need to do is to actually connect into the virtual machine. So just a reminder, this is a console I've opened um, on my machine, which actually is a Linux machine. Um, and I will show you what to do from a Windows machine if you're on Windows, but I'll just show you the Linux one because that's where I'll be doing all the work. I'll show you that one first. So it's SSH and then the IP address. So if you remember, it was 223 we've set up. We've got the server running, which has started that. And we need to say, tell it that it's the root user as well, I'll just remember, because that's the only user on the system at the moment. So it's connected and it says it can't find that we've ever connected to this before. So it's saying, check that fingerprint. Well, we can assume it is correct because that IP address is the one I've just set up. So just type yes and press enter and it's asking for roots password and hopefully this will work and it has and there we are we've got the same prompt up here as we have on the real BLFS terminal down here so now I'm going to do uh, a set command set PS1 equals quotes and then I'm going to paste in this so it's as it was with LFS just highlight it and then middle click to paste it and then close the quotes and hopefully the right let me do export actually export hopefully that will change that's better so I've got a similar prompt to the one that, that, that's on the host Um, in fact, let me put a little space after that, just so there's a space after the uh, dollar prompts. In fact, that's not copied correctly. That should be a hash. 
yes, I know why. It's the way this works. It's not ideal. Um, I'm going to cheat here, actually. Um, I'm just going to put a hash in there. Oh, that hasn't worked, has it? Right, that's better. And I'm also going to change something else. I'm going to change the code so this actually appears in red as it would do if I was logged in as root. So it's going to be this code here, I think. So change that 31 to uh, 32 to 31. Yeah, that's it. That's better. So it's kind of faked up at the moment. Um, some of the configuration we're going to do very soon will actually um, manipulate this PS1 environment variable to switch correctly the color and the prompt. Um, what's happening is the because I've copied this, it's been echoed to the screen, it's not copying correctly and that's why it's not switching correctly even though I'm the root. So I've kind of faked this a little bit but it, it, it will do for now. Um, okay, what do we need to do next? Well, first of all, we should go to the sources directory and then BLFS. And yeah, we can see all our stuff there, so we're in the right place. So really, the next thing we can do is we can get rid of that for the moment. Uh, yeah, we'll be coming across that again. And we can actually do this bit now because we can copy and paste. So let's highlight this again. And we can directly paste this into this window because this is on the on the host system now and that's the um, script that removes these LA files I probably won't find any at the moment but we can run it and see what happens yeah it's probably done something and if it has it's done it silently um, let me show you what to do how to connect if you're on the Windows system, so I've got a Windows virtual box here. Um, what you need to do is to load up a browser and search for something called Putty. Hopefully, it'll be the first um, link you come to is this one at putty.org, www.putty.org. If you click onto that, as you can see, it said it was a SSH client for Windows. So you can download Putty here, so let's click on that. And we want a 64 bit Windows installer. And obviously, if you're on 32 bit Windows, it's that top one you want, but we want that one there. So let's save it. That's downloaded nice and small. Click on it and let's run it. It says it's just warning us an executable may contain viruses. And yep, published by Simon Tatham. Let's just run it and install it with all the defaults. Um, let's put a shortcut on the desktop and install. Um, I won't bother reading the readme file at the moment. So that's installed. Let's get rid of that. So now there's the desktop uh, shortcut is created. If you double click that and we can enter some details here. So the IP address we want is 192.168.0.223. Make sure that's port 22 and make sure that's selected as SSH, which is the default and then we can put a name in here so we can say BLFS um, VBOX image for example and just click save so that saves that so next time you know if you go away have a cup of tea you want to reconnect again you can just double click that similar warning to the one we saw on uh, Linux 
So in theory, that number there should be the same as the one we saw in Linux. So just trust it because we know we've just created this IP address 223. And there we go, we have a login prompt. Can I make this any bigger? Let's see if I can change settings, make this bigger. Um, right, there it is there. So let's try 16. Apply here, yeah, that's nice and big. So login as root, and the password is root. And there you go, we've got the bash prompt up. It hasn't come up in nice pretty colours because I haven't made that permanent. But, well, <laughs> I was going to say you could just copy it, but you can't in Windows. But if you could put up with that black and white prompt for now, it's, it's not many more commands that we need to do before that actually does become colour and a bit more meaningful. But, that yes, that's how you can connect uh, from Windows. So we can go to sources and cd into blfs and there you can see all the files. So that's that. So I'll come out of that and go back to my Linux prompt. So we've done the LA file, clean up script and we can carry on with this after LFS configuration issues. Um, issues kind of creates the idea that their problems are not really problems, they're just things that need to be done. So we'll just go through these. So again, it talks about creating a boot device, custom boot device, as it did with LFS. It's up to you if you want to do this. You do need to install another bit of software to burn the CD if you want to create a bootable CD. Um, as I said, I consider that any any of the main Linux distributions that have got a live CD option is probably just as good as any. For this sort of thing where we're doing what the term is development work because we're doing compiling, you probably want to stick with something like Gen 2 because the tools are going to be available on the live CD as you boot from it. You won't need to install anything else. So it's probably a good recommendation. Next, go to console fonts. Um, yeah, it's, it's up to you if you want to read this and do this. I'm not going to bother with that now. Um, mainly because this is all on a virtual console. It's a virtual machine. If you're at a physical console and this was the actual text display, you may want to change it. You might want to change it if you are got different language or different characters, but uh, for our purposes, it's it's not necessary. Firmware, again, not going to bother with that for this uh, demonstration. If you're installing on a real machine and you're really going to use BLFS for real work, you probably want to read this and go through it. So we'll skip all that. Multiple sound cars, again, this was mentioned in LFS. We're not going to bother with that. Um... Yeah, we'll just ignore all that. It's not important for this demonstration. Okay, so adding users. So this is where we're going to add a normal user. Um, so it explains that user add is a program that we use to add a user um, it says about defaults that can be um, changed for setting up for each user um, and then it says when adding a user you can use the M parameter to create the user's home directory and copy files from the ETC scale uh, directory. Now, because it does copy stuff from there, which can be copied for any user, I'm not actually going to run this command at the moment. I'm going to save that for a little bit later on because some of the configurations 
we're creating will go into this etc scale and let's say the user ad will uh, use those files so let's just center tab the next link and carry on for the moment so this shows the systems and groups that could be used in the complete BLF installation just for information next bit is about the bash shell startup files so this is where we start to configure the system and make it a bit more usable a bit more friendly a bit more like a normal Linux distribution so the first one we're going to modify is the ETC profile and if you remember from Linux from scratch we already created a minimal profile and in that we created the lang variable we exported the lang variable so you might want to just look at that yourself because if I remember rightly this information gets put in a separate file which gets loaded um, by profile so that's just worth bearing in mind just making a note of that before we overwrite this by copying and pasting the stuff in this box here so we'll just paste that in and as you can see here there's this PS1 variable and some other variables with red green normal and this is this is the bit of logic that changes the prompt color depending on what sort of user we're logged in as so I just press enter then we've got a profile.d directory where we can add individual scripts for initialization of certain things so we'll just run that one in Um, and then this bash completion is quite useful but uh, apparently it says it's quite controversial as to whether it should be done I always use it if you have issues with it then obviously you can skip this bit so I'll just copy and paste that in and an extra directory for all those completion scripts just install that now we've got the dir colors script file and this is one of the scripts that goes in this profile.d directory we created before we just created so we can copy that in and this is the one that um, actually color gives colors hints to files we've got an extra paths shell script which allows us to append uh, paths to the current path we've got some more scripts here for read line setting a default U mask for when files are created and an internationalization script and this is the one where we need to set what was in the original ETC profile from Linux from scratch this is the bit we need to paste in here now so it's been moved from the profile script into this internationalization script so I'll just paste that in and doing the OF so I'll just double check that one because it was a bit of a cut and paste from different places there so just cut that so yeah that's okay so that, that means that your language that you chose will still be configured at boot up and now we're going to do bash rc paste that in and I'm wondering if this might be a good place to put the uh, the variable for The make, uh, I forgot to remember where it was. Um, no, it was that one there, I think. Yeah. So we could paste that into that bash RC. So 
So let's do VI forward slash ETC forward slash bash RC. Let's go all the way down the bottom to I for insert, new line, paste that in. Let's change that to four because we've got four cores. Obviously, however many cores you've allocated to your virtual machine or how many you've got in your real machine, just change that to whatever you fancy. And just put another. So let's source that. Just check that's actually going to be red. Well, there you go. There's the prompt that's changed. So all these scripts we're copying and pasting are being activated now by doing that source. Let's do an echo on make flags and yeah it's there, there it is. So that's good, That's let's grab that. So if we go back to the setup files, we've done bash RC. Now we've got some bash profiles so we want to put these all into the etc scale directory which we haven't created yet so let's do that next etc scale so for these cats we want to substitute the home directory with etc scale Oops. and just copy the rest of that so ignore the home directory squiggle and the forward slash and just copy from that down to there and to do the same for each one of these as you can see in each of these scripts it's it's finding out if there are certain files already existing and reading them if they do and so on so again, let's do cat, copy that bit, copy the ETC scale, and then the rest of it, just paste in. And of course, you can go back and modify these if you want to make adjustments to them. That's what Linux is all about. It's all about doing things your own way. But for the uh, same as with LFS, for the purpose of this um, demonstration, I'll just be following the book as closely as possible. There may be the odd occasion where I veer off slightly, um, and that's just few, through preference. There may be a perfectly good reason, but it may be just be more preference. Finally, we need to create the the colors capability. So just copy that in. So let's have a look at the ETC scale. Right, there's nothing there, but of course they're all hidden because they begin with a full stop. So to view them, let's do LS minus LA and there are those files there. So they don't exist for root, but we'll be using root as little as possible root will just use the defaults in ETC but when we create our user which is very soon these files will be copied into the user's home directory and the user will have, will have individual access to these to, to modify as they see fit let's go on to the next one so this is talking about Vim RC files um, I don't normally change anything here except for using the set root I don't find the other ones that useful so I'm just going to do uh, VI ETC Vim RC and this is the one we already had from LFS so I'm just going to copy that set router in and save it. Um, yes, actually, if I go back one, I'm sure. Don't bash. I'll see right there. It's okay. 
Yeah, this one we could copy into the scale file as well. So let's do that. Um, no, actually, let's leave it because I think by default the one in etc will be used and the user can overwrite it by creating their own .vmrc. So we'll just leave that as it is. So the next one is all about etc um, issue, which is something that you only see on the uh, login screen. Uh, what it does, it allows you to put some information on at the login prompt. Um, and the top part of this says about uh, doing command called clear and redirecting the output of that command into the etc issue. And what that does, that clears the screen before it prints out anything that's in the issue um, script. So if we do that and then edit Issue. You can see it's created some control characters, which are the control characters that clear the screen. And we can type anything here. If I save that, now you won't see it on a, um, a terminal because we've accessed remotely. This is only the sort of thing you see from a real terminal. And in our case, a real terminal is this terminal. So if I log out of this, you can see what it's done is it's cleared the screen and then printed up the contents of that issue page. Now it's down to you whether you have that clear those clear control characters or not. It can be a bit of a problem if you're trying to debug something because when you're booting the machine because after all those script files load, um, the screen gets cleared just before the login prompt. So it kind of makes it a bit harder to debug what's going on if you're having a problem. If I can demonstrate this actually, if I come out of this, go back here and actually do a reboot. We'll see what I mean. So these are the shutdown scripts running. And when it starts, so the startup scripts, but as soon as the login prompt is ready to be displayed, that clear has cleared the screen and then displayed the contents of the issue file. So you, I, I don't think at this point it's a good idea to have that. Normally you might want that because it's a good security thing. You know, stuff that's gone before is erased before the user's being asked to log in. So if we go back to our prompt, we'll have to SSH back in again. What I'll do is load up that issue file again. I'm going to delete it all, get rid of those control characters. Um, what we'll do is just copy and paste all this stuff in. No, I won't. I'll do something different. What it's saying here is that each of these letters, if they're preceded by a backslash, it will display some sort of information. So if I press I for insert, why is that not? That's better. Um, we can do something like type in a bit of information. and oh, not a capital, lowercase b. So what happens here when this issue file is displayed it will substitute these escaped characters for some information that relates to what they represent. So I'll type these all in so you can see them.
Okay, so I'll put some of those in. Save that now. Log out. Go back to our real virtual terminal. I'll have to log in. And I'll do another reboot so you can see it from um, a fresh boot. You can see the difference. The screen won't clear this time. Plus, we'll get all this information displayed just before the login prompt. So there you go, this, this information is now being displayed, the board rate, date, system name, TTY number, architecture the system's on, the host name, domain, there isn't any, kernel release number, time, how many users are logged in at the moment, there's none, because it's just been freshly rebooted, and then the version string from the kernel. Um, possibility that you may not want to display this but as it would be on a virtual terminal it's probably not an issue but it's down to you whether you want to display this information or not and how you want to display it so we'll go back to the host terminal and reconnect again you can see we don't get that issue on a remote connection it's only for a physical local connection <coughs> Uh, just one thing I've thought of. Uh, you'll notice that I'm pressing the recall, the up arrow, to see the history. Uh, and that's a security thing that uh, the BLFS team have uh, incorporated so that the history of the root user is always deleted uh, between reboots. Um, and that means that if some, you know, if there's several people who've got root access, they can't see what uh, commands have been used by other other users of root. Uh, for our situation, it could be a bit of a hindrance because there are times where you will want to recall um, some commands. So to do that, to retur return the ability to have a history that you can recall. We need to make a change in profile, in ETC profile. So if we edit that and go down to the bottom, I believe it is. Um, uh, oh yes, there it is there. Yeah, so it's about halfway down uh, on line 47. It's this unset hist file. So if you're at the beginning of the line on that line, press I for insert and press hash to comment out that, that line. So when the BLFS has been installed, you can come back and remove this hash comment and it will return to its uh, more secure functionality of not remembering the uh, history for the root user. Normal users, the history is retained, it's just purely for the root user. So I'll save and exit that. If I log out and log back in again, you can see the history is back there again now. So next we move on to random number generation. Um, so this is just a case of installing a script so it just helps with the uh, how random the random devices are basically so we need to go back to sources BLFS and then into the BLFS boot scripts directory and we copy and paste that command in and then install the boot scripts to start that random daemon and we should start that now as well by typing forward slash etc init dot d forward slash random start and that's been initialized so 
So the next thing to do is move on to the LSB release. So we go back up one directory to the BLFS directory where we've got all the files and we can now download this LSB release which as, it's, as it's, you can see it gives uh, some information uh, to the Linus Standex base standard about this distribution. So we type wget space, paste in that link and press enter. And here now we see that this is not downloading this file because it hasn't got any certificates to check the validity of this um, secure site that has been supplied. So what we need to do is what it suggests is to type in the same command but with a switch no check certificate so I can just copy that and paste it in at the end and it will download and ignore that and it's it's received it so we can extract that SB release change into it and we can start copying and pasting the commands to install this little script You notice again these are two commands and they've been joined together with two ampersands which means if the first one fails the second one won't run so it's worth bearing in mind if if you copy and paste and you have a failure you should be able to see where it fails so you can continue once you fix the failure with the subsequent commands and you can see both commands have run there's the message from the first command and there's the message from the second command So we can quickly test um, uh, this has been installed by typing lsb uh, oh it's an underscore that's why I wouldn't find it lsb underscore release minus a and you can see there's all the information as it says here from the etc lsb release file that was created in the uh, linux from scratch uh, demonstration so it's it's retrieved that information from that file and this switch here displays all the information so that's okay we can remove that and then we move on to security which is going to be the next video um, just before I finish this one um, we need to add a user, a normal user which I should do now so there's no instructions in the Linux from scratch uh, sorry the beyond the Linux from scratch book about adding a user specifically other than this add command so just a few little commands to enter it enter, enter this user add and to test it so at the prompt we type user add oops, user add space minus m as it suggests there so that it copies the some of these configuration files into the home directory of the user about to create and we type the name of the user so I'm going to call it BLFS BLFS user press enter and that's it it didn't re respond to say it's done anything but if we do ls-l on the home directory we've got a user uh, home directory called BLFS and we look into that it's empty apparently but remember those dots uh, those files we put in forward slash etc uh, scale were hidden so if we do ls minus la that proves that they've been copied across from etc scale so the next thing we need to do is to test that we can actually get into that user 
by typing su space minus space blfs and we now become that user. This also proves that the uh, scripts that we've copied and pasted are working. So the colors changed and the prompt has changed from a hash for the root in red to a green with a dollar for a normal user. So that works fine. So we can press control D there to go back to the root. And now we need to set a password for that user. So we do PASSWD, name of the user, which is BLFS. And it asks us for a password. So I'll put in something nice and simple, which it warns me about, just so I don't forget it. And it's been done. So in theory, we can log out now. And instead of doing SSH with the root, we can do BLFS. Now, if your username where your tell uh, where your SSH from is not BLFS, you will have to put in BLFS at the IP address every time. As my name is already BLFS, it works that I can leave off the name and just type in BLFS. But for this demonstration, I will use BLFS at the IP address. So I just type the password in and we're in, we're in as the normal user. And if we want to become the root, we can do su minus, type in the root's password, and we're now the root. On the BLFS 8.4 demo machine. Okay, so that's it for this video. It's a little introduction. We've got the main configuration, login scripts, users are all configured. We've enabled ourselves to be able to copy and paste from um, a browser, although it's outside of this system at the moment, at least we can copy and paste uh, code into the virtual machine via this SSH connection that we're using. You can see at the top there the machine name, uh, user we're connecting as and the IP address. Um, so the next stage in part two will be to start installing some security software, which includes PAM, the pluggable authentication modules. Um, we'll install sudo as well, which makes things a little bit easier for us to become root, just to do the odd single command here and there save typing the roots command in all the time and and our own um, if you've used sudo before you'll know that there's a timer where it doesn't ask you for a password until a certain amount of time has elapsed um, uh, yeah and then we'll start to get onto some of the serious software the next bit of security will be the x system the x window system um, and then we'll endeavor to, once that's working, to install a browser. And at that point, we'll be able to wholly be in the virtual machine. We'll have a graphical interface and we'll have a graphical browser. So at that point, we can uh, stop using the host browser and the host terminal, um, as we'll be able to copy and paste stuff from the browser within the BLFS virtual machine. Um, into a terminal within uh, the BLFS term, uh, virtual machine. And then after that, we'll be installing some some more software, some of the more heavyweight software. And as you'll see, there'll be lots of dependencies to install, lots of libraries. Uh, it could get a little bit sticky at times, but um, it's just a case of, as I say, keeping a note of what, what you've installed um, and what you need to revisit as well. So thank you very much for listening and uh, hope to see you in the next video. Goodbye.